Hi, I'm Caroline Levin. I'm the co-founder of A Mighty Blaze, the book initiative that began just when the pandemic did. Uh, because all booksellers had their stores shuttered and authors like myself had their tours canceled, I decided that we really needed to do something. And The Mighty Blaze was born along with the help of Jenna Blum, who is now the CEO, because she does this stuff so much better than I do. So I'm really, really happy to have Chris Bernard here. He's the author of the brilliantly named Small Animals Caught in Traps, which is just a great, great novel. and Everybody should read it. As you can see, if you go in the chat, um, <laughs> it's a great, great cover. As you go in the chat, you can see like there's a link for where to buy the book, which is bookshop.org, which we at Abide Blaze like to use, but also go to your favorite indie bookstore, walk in, tell them you want this book, and trust me, you do. If you have any comments and questions, like put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Okay, so I'm going to read you something about Chris first, um, which I just loved. As a young writer, Chris, or C.B. Bernard, as it says on his book, lashed his canoe to his truck and pointed the bow upstream, north and west, seeking a different life than the one he'd known in his native New England. He found it in Sitka, a small fishing town on an island where southeast Alaska collides with the Pacific. Isn't that great, that word collides? Working as a journalist and exploring the woods and waters of his new home, he'd leapt blindly and had landed on top of his own family's history. A century earlier, a distant relative, Captain Joe Bernard, had also left home for a new life in Alaska. For decades, he'd sailed the Arctic in his schooner Teddy Bear, living among the Eskimos and Inuit east of Barrow and north of everything. His journals recount the shipwrecks and horrific winters he survived, his bouts with scurvy and starvation, and his observations about the land he came to love. As Chris chased the legacy of his explorer relative, he recovered those journals and used them to guide his own exploration of Alaska. That became one of his books, Chasing Alaska, which is a moving portrait of the last frontier, then and now. Um, so that's the backdrop. Small Animals Caught in Traps is Chris's novel. He's also the author of the novels Ordinary Bear, Chase in the in Chasing Alaska, as I said. And finally, he won an Oregon Book Award in nonfiction. He was a Publishers Weekly Top 10 travel pick. He's written for Gray Sporting Journal, Catapult, Bear Deluxe, Cobalt, Huffington Post, Professional Mariner, and elsewhere. His work has also been excerpted in the Utney region. He's a saltwater fly a fisherman, which we're going to talk about, an occasional bolt builder, which we're also going to talk about. He's lived in Alaska, Oregon. In Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And we have talked about how we both grew up in the suburbs before we got on here. He now lives off the southern Rhode Island coast with his wife, Kim, and their daughter, Nessie. A dog, so, Nessie. Oh, dog. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you don't have enough coffee in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk a little about the book, and then I'm going to talk to Chris. So... Your novel shows a father and a daughter fighting towards hope through a traumatic past. And it's kind of um, great that they live in the town of the greatly named disappointment, Oregon. Your main character is a washed up boxer, Louis Yaw, and he's led a life of violence and he doesn't want his daughter. That's where I got the daughter from. He doesn't want his daughter to live the life that he has. So what I want to do is I want you to tell us, tell us about the book, because I always think writers are haunted into writing what they write. Was it this way for you? And if so, what was haunting you? So first tell us the story of the book and then tell us what was haunting you. So the book is, as you mentioned, set in Disappointment, Oregon, kind of a runt of a town where the coastal rainforests meet the high desert canyons of the eastern part of the state. And it tells the story of a troubled fly fishing guide trying like hell to help his daughter find her way in the world, even as he's losing his own. Uh, but that's not what it's about. That's just what happens in it. What it's about is drowning. I think people drown the way Hemingway said they go broke gradually and then suddenly. And Louis Yaw is very much a man drowning gradually. And I think the book is about the people who love him most, his daughter, his best friend, his wife, trying to save him from drowning. And of course, the risk of saving somebody from drowning is sometimes they pull you down with them and you have to decide whether right. to let go. 
Uh, that's so. that's a really astute. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to say that's a really astute thing, and I think anybody who's a writer should pay attention to it because a book is not about just the actions. It's really about the themes underneath, and that theme of drowning is totally crucial to this wonderful book. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think uh, I've been trying to answer the question, what is your book about? I don't like to talk about a book when I'm working on it because I think novels, right. are, I, no, novels are a kind of idea, right? And ideas are like right. fires. You build a spark, you coax it to life, and you have to shield it or it goes out. And for me, talking about an idea that's only half formed, half formed is a little dangerous because you could lose it. But there's a kind of danger in not talking about them as well, because then you get up on a podcast with Caroline Levitt and she asks you what your book's about. And you don't know what the hell to tell her. <laughs> you know, I love that you were talking about that where you don't like to. I don't either. It's always very kind of. You go in, I go into deep freeze when people ask what I'm working on because you don't really know. And you're right. It is like a fire about to go out. So then I want to ask you, so when, once you've had a draft, do you let people read it or do you have a, a people that you trust enough to read it or do you wait until your agent, um, the fabulous Laurie Strachan, reads it? What do you do then? I, uh, I've had this ongoing debate with other writer friends of mine about when it's appropriate to share a work uh, because it, to my way of thinking, once you let somebody else into it, it, it changes for better or for worse, often for better. Um, I have built a small cadre of people whose feedback I trust implicitly. They're all named in the acknowledgments of this book and they, they gave me some fantastic advice when reading this but it was a long time before I was able to share the book with them because I wanted, I wouldn't say I'm a control freak about it, but when you can only see something the first time once, you know, you can only make right. one first impression. So I really wanted to put the book in front of them that I wanted to put in front of them. Uh, but their, their feedback was invaluable. And you, uh, I've said it before, you, you have to let other writers, readers, critics, editors, into your lives, but never let them into your head when you're writing the book. Uh, oh, that's such a great phrase. That's such a great phrase. But don't you also think that sometimes read, also it's important to have more than one reader because readers bring their own stuff, baggage with them when they read. I mean, I made the mistake once of showing a book about open adoption to a woman who had a really bad open adoption. And she told me to burn the book. <laughs> just to burn that book. So that wasn't very helpful. But so it's interesting. It, it is very important to get other perspective, but you almost have to weigh it and against what you yourself feel about a certain Absolutely. book. Yeah. I'll, I, so if you, uh, let me run this by you. I'll run it up the flagpole and see if you salute. I'll, run, I'll let like five or six people read it. And then I will kind of triangulate their feedback and where it overlaps where they all told me the same thing. To me, it's definitely a red flag that that's something that right. needs to be addressed. But if it's just one person, it starts to feel a little bit subjective. So those I tend to ignore. Is that similar to your process? Yes, that's a, that's a great, great statement because it is. You have to be strong enough in what you believe in, what you want to do. And, and even if like all the people I have read something say, no, I don't, we don't like this part. And I really like it. Then I feel like, well, it's up to me to change it and fix it. So they see what I'm doing and to do it correctly. So I want to talk about the sense of place. We were talking a little bit before we came on here about how the natural world is so important to us and what it means to us. And I just had this image of you. I, growing up in the forest and you said you grew up in the <laughs> suburbs. So I would so I would love to hear about what it was like for you as a boy growing up in the suburbs and what your first experience out in the wild was like and how it changed you. Oh, there's uh, there's a chapter in Chasing Alaska uh, early in the book where I haven't been in Alaska very long and a, a, a guy who kind of took me under his wing when I moved up there took me deer hunting for the first time. And we, we got in his boat. We went, you know, 40 miles out of town to an uninhabited island in the middle of nowhere. And we hiked deep into the woods. And for a kid from the suburbs, it was both beautiful and a little intimidating. Right. And, and at one point, uh, I, there was a pile of what I thought was uh, deer sign. And I pointed it out. 
And he laughed and said, that's bear sign. And in that moment, I kind of realized <laughs> this is not my backyard in Massachusetts with the few trees that I pretend is the wilderness. And I realized that I, I really had a lot to learn about uh, different ways of living. And to varying degrees of success, I think, uh, I, I put myself in wholeheartedly into some outdoor adventures while I was in Alaska and enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I, I don't, <laughs> I'm not great at it. <laughs> That's but, all right. Yeah. I, uh, I have some friends, I think, who really inspired some of the characters in this book, just in the way they are incredibly competent in, in the wilderness. But to me, the wilderness, not only is it critical to our way of being, and I think we need to spend more time outdoors, but it was also just a great setting for the book because as a metaphor for somebody who's kind of lost and fighting, it works. Yeah, I was going to say that Lewis, you could say, is in a wilderness, um, which leads us to my question about how our past lives and traumas live with us and how we deal with it. I mean, Lewis grew up with an abusive dad. So, of course, when he's having a child, he's terrified about how can he be a good dad himself because he doesn't have any role model. Um, he wants to rewrite his own script, but he, what's so ingenious about the book is he won, he feels he's going to have a son, of course, and instead he has a daughter. So first of all, I want to know, do you think that we can ever get rid of childhood trauma? And if so, what are the best ways? And then I'd like you to talk a little bit about how, about Lewis's struggle and how, how you, what you think he achieved without spoilers, if that's possible. Uh, so I think uh, the characters live and breathe around the Terrebonne River, right? That's the river that runs throughout the book. Right, it's the right. river they died on. Uh, and to me, that river is a really good metaphor for what Lewis is going through because uh, rivers go where they want to go. Over centuries, they can carve deep canyons in the land. They can wear down stone. You can change the course of a river by building dams, but it's not easy. It requires a lot of work and engineering and a little bit of luck. And isn't our past the same way? Doesn't our past really wear us down and go where it wants to go and shape us? And you can overcome it with a lot of work. It's not always successful. So I think that early in the book, the river uh, floods its banks. There's a lot of rain, it floods its banks. It's pretty destructive. And to me, that kind of sets the tone for what's to come in the book. If you think of the river as a past, uh, and, or you think of our past as a river, I suppose. Uh, it feels a little cliche to come on a show and talk about a book and just keep mentioning metaphors. But the book no, is I love the metaphors. I love the <laughs> metaphors. And I'm sure all the writers and readers out there love it too. That's, that's such a great, great image. Um, I mean, the book is so, so vivid. Um, again, it's Small Animals Caught in Trap. Buy it at your favorite indie bookstore. You can go to bookshop.org and they'll find a bookstore close to you. Um, I want to I want to mention a quote that you said that was the wildest things aren't in the forest or the jungles or even in the shadows. They're inside of us. We spend our lives at building cages, work, marriage, friendships, families to contain those things. I'd love it if you would talk about that wonderful quote. I think the, uh, the, I mean, the, 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 the title obviously is a, it happens literally, a small animal is caught in trap in the first sentence of the book, but that's just to establish the metaphor uh, for what the human condition, for our lives, for our careers, for marriage and family, for the pressures we put on ourselves and on each other. And I think that the idea that we are the, scariest things in the world is proven day in and day out, uh, not just by our actions and behaviors, but by, uh, by our own thoughts. You know, we, we, we are more afraid of our, or, or we should be <laughs> more afraid of our own thoughts than anything else in the world. That's uh, true. And I think that Lewis is very much a man struggling with that. The, the antagonist in the book is probably just him in his own head uh, preventing himself, haunting himself, preventing himself from being who he wants to be, who he can be, and kind of haunting himself uh, because of the things that have happened to him in the past. So 
Chasing Alaska was short pieces. How difficult was it to move into a longer form and to write a novel? How did you approach it? Did you outline it? Did you just sort of throw caution to the wind and go through it? I probably shouldn't admit this on No, the yes, admit no. it. Admit it. <laughs> I, I, wrote, I wrote two novels before this one that uh, okay. I, I signed with Laura, my agent, with one of them in 2007 and thought, I, I found an agent, I've written the novel, it's here, I've done it. And now it's 2023 and my book is just coming out. It's a different book, but it took me that long. The first ones just did not sell. So I always... I had no trouble writing novels. I just had trouble writing novels that sold, which may not be the right answer to the question. Chasing Alaska was the surprise to me that uh, my first book to come out was actually nonfiction. Uh, it was a full, you know, full length nonfiction, but I, I thought it would be a novel that came out before then. So to me, that was the outlier. Uh, well, well, I always say it's never the writer's fault. It isn't. It's the time. No, it isn't. It isn't. It's the timing. It's luck. It's the connections. It's sort of, you know, you have no idea what what was going on with editors then. Maybe they were afraid of losing their job or something terrible had just happened to them. It's never, never the author's fault. So. Uh, well, I, that's kind of you to say. I'll tell you this. Uh, when Laura took a chance on me back then, she was the first person inside the industry to really tell me, you can do this, because I, I didn't get an MFA, I didn't go to writing school, uh, I didn't really have networks of writers. One of the editors that she sent the book to was Christopher Lehman Haupt. Uh, who was oh my fantastic. God! He, he wanted to buy the book, he was a fiction editor at the time, but he was unable to convince uh, the, the rest of the team at the publisher to buy the book. But he brought me to New York, we talked about the book, we went to Cape Cod fly fishing together and talked about how we might get the book into shape to publish. And while he ultimately wasn't successful, uh, he saw something in the book that other people had not, which meant he saw something in me that other people had not. And I cannot tell you how much of a vote of confidence that was for me and how that changed my life. Um, so maybe the books didn't sell, but uh, writing them, I learned a lot from and shopping them around, I learned a lot from. I think That's you're right, the publishing world is a is an machine engineered to effectively right. crush the human soul, but it also <laughs> can be something that buoys people up because think of all the great books it has brought us and all the great experiences right. we've had as a result of it. That's an incredible story. Did you ever consider or have you written an essay about that? It's just a no, I don't even story. like to admit it. <laughs> and here I am admitting oh, no, it on no, no, no. camera to you. You know what? You have to, <laughs> because first of all, it's going to help so many writers to know that, um, to know that that kind of thing does happen. And you're right. Sometimes you just need that one vote of confidence. That that actually happened to me too with Jonathan Galassi when he was at Farrah oh, Strauss yeah. and Giroux. He wanted to buy the book and he had me come in once a week for a whole year to talk about it. And ultimately it couldn't get sold, but it's still like, I still have it in my mind, all those talks we had and the fact that somebody who had a reputation believed in me enough. And that's what's so important. And you could, you got to write that essay because writers, writers are going to love it. They are. And so will readers because it's, it's kind of a window into the world. So I know that you built boats, which I find absolutely fascinating. So I want to know how you got into it, what the process is like, and is it at all like building a novel? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I got into it kind of the wrong way. Uh, when, oh. I was, <clears throat> when I was writing Chasing Alaska, uh, <clears throat> when I first moved to Alaska and found out about my ancestor, Joe Bernard, uh, the first thing I found of his was a photo of his boat, the teddy bear. And he had built that himself, a 65-foot schooner, uh, gaff rig, two-masted schooner that he sailed around the Arctic. And throughout the course of 14 years, as I researched his life and the book, uh, that picture hung over my desk and I moved all around the country and that picture kind of stayed with me. Toward the end of my research for the book, while I was in Alaska in 2010, I guess, 2011, uh, I found the remains of that boat where he had dragged them up uh, onto an island in Cor outside Cordova, Alaska, and let them just kind of molder there. So I brought some of that wood back to Portland, Oregon, where I was living at the time, and decided to close the, 
loop of my, uh, you know, 100 years apart of his adventures in Alaska and mine by trying to build a boat and incorporating some of the wood from the teddy bear just to kind of uh, put a cap on the book. The biggest thing I'd built at that point was a chicken coop. So I <laughs> had no schooling on boat building. Uh, I just went about it uh, trial and error. I found some plans for the boat I wanted to build. I read a lot of books. I watched a couple of YouTube videos and I just kind of half-assed my way through it and ended up building a, I will call it a beautiful boat. I think a lot of boat builders would tell you it was not a beautiful boat, but there's a saying that you can't build an ugly wooden boat. It wasn't for lack of trying. Uh, I, I really <laughs> did a few things wrong, but uh, the process, I learned a lot about woodworking, but I also just learned a lot about myself, I think, because I had all the modern tools. I had YouTube videos. I had everything to build this. But uh, Joe Bernard, who built his boat, did it all with hand tools. He, he milled his own lumber. He planed his own. Wow. And he did everything by hand, you know, over a century earlier. Uh, and I think I just learned a lot about how reliant I have become on different things uh, that maybe I could do without. And build, writing a novel is kind of similar for me. That's a really good question. I'm not sure I'd thought of that in parallel that way, but uh, I, I kind of, I think my wife will tell you that if there's a hard way to do something, I will find it and then make it harder <laughs> for myself. Like I, here are the hoops you have to jump through. I'm going to light them on fire. I'm going to strap on roller skates and then I'm going to tie the blindfold on. That's kind of my approach to life. I think writing this novel, I had the same experience. I just, uh, I kind of violated all my own processes on it and learned the hard way through trial and error. And that was what boat building was like for me. We have the gorgeous and wonderful Almighty Blazer, Margaret Pennard here. Thank you for being here, Margaret. And she has a question for you. How Hi, do Margaret. you how do you rearrange, disarrange the books in your gorgeous bookcase behind you? <laughs> <laughs> they are sorted uh, through a system that would only make sense to me as I am my own librarian. Um, but they are grouped by author and roughly by genre. And they go this way and that way to make them all fit. Okay. She also wants to know if disappointment was inspired by the town of Boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no comment, Margaret. <laughs> no, uh, dis disappointment is a wholly, wholly made up uh, town. I, I drew it on a map and I created it on my own because it needed to exist in a certain place for me. And the river is made up as well. But I think as anybody who has lived in Oregon as long as Margaret has and who knows Oregon as well as she does, will find lots of recognizable parts of a lot of different parts of Oregon there. Stephanie Robinson also thanked you profusely for sharing that story about Christopher Lehman Hall. So there's another person who thinks Thanks. you should write an essay about it. It's a great, <laughs> great story. Um, so... I want to know, how did you become a writer? I mean, when, when, did you always write? Did you want to be a writer when you were a kid? Um, how did that, and when did you start to take it seriously? I think I always wanted to be a writer and I think I always took it seriously, but I don't think I knew quite what that meant. Uh, you know, there's no qualifying exam to be a writer. There's no board that certifies you and gives you the license, you know, what it would be poetic license, I guess, to go out and write books. I just, uh, after college, I tried to figure out how to live like a writer. And I applied to MFA programs and got in, but chose not to go for various reasons. I, I think I didn't want to teach. Uh, I think the writers I admired most kind of live big lives in the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to follow that model and just have experiences that informed who I was and what I wrote. And as I kind of, you know, I, I've always made a living as a writer, either as a journalist or a copywriter or a number of different ways. Sometimes that got in the way of my trying to write fiction when you write all day in a job, sometimes it's hard to go home at night and be creative, uh, which is possibly why it took me so long. Also possibly just because I'm a slow learner. But I think I have been trying to write books as long as I have been able to write. And uh, yeah, you know, writing is not just something you do. It's a way of being in the world, right? It's a way of seeing things. Right. And I think I've always had a writing life, even when I haven't 
been, I mean, there's no such thing as an aspiring writer. If you're, if you write, you're a writer. You're, uh, that's right. While, I was, that's while right. I was trying to learn to write books that people would buy. You were a writer. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. There's a line in, I forget, it was some Jeff Bridges movie where he wanted to be a writer and someone said to him, you can't call yourself a writer until you're published. Not true. So I'm glad you said that. Oh, we have another excellent question from Margaret Pinard. Would you rather have talent or tenacity? And does it differ in different arenas, like writing about out, like outdoor, being outdoors versus writing? I think you have both actually, talent and tenacity. It's kind of you to say, I think... Uh... What's the expression? It's better be lucky than good. I think uh, I don't know about talent. I have always been tenacious. And, uh, you know, like a lot of writers, I think I could wallpaper a Costco with rejection notices I've gotten over the years. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and you can't let that stop you. You know, 80, maybe 80% 80 of writing is showing up every day and facing a blank page or even worse, a page that you have already filled out and needs to be broken down and rewritten. Right. And I right. really feel like showing up every day is how you get there. And That's for right. me, that, that was always, you know, 4.30 in the morning, five in the morning before work began. I feel like the day is magic then because you haven't seen the pile of dirty dishes that need to be washed or the bills that need to be paid <laughs> or the right. dogs that need to be walked. The world is yours to uh, imagine at that point. I want to remind everybody that you, if you want to, please go to YouTube and subscribe to Mighty Blaze channel because there's hundreds of fascinating, amazing interviews like this one. And it's just a really great thing to do. Okay, so we have another question. Also, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, Stephanie asks again, if we're not, if we aren't jumping through hoops on fire, how do we know yeah. we're writing? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's I, a very I feel good like question. That might be a rhetorical question. <laughs> um, I, I think that. Well, let me ask you that, Caroline. You've been doing this a lot longer than I have, and a lot more successfully than I have. How would you answer that question? That's very kind of you to say. Um, I would say that you're always writing. You know, like if you even on days when I'm not writing, I'm thinking about the characters, which is why my email is full of notes to myself that say things like have her find out earlier rather than later. And then 10 hours later, I have to figure out what the hell did I mean by that? But I think it's just a writer sensibility. If you're a writer, you're always seeing things in terms of plot or structure or things that you can use. We're sort of human sponges. So I think you're just always writing and you don't have to beat yourself up about it. I think that's true. I think writing also doesn't always look like writing. Sometimes it looks like walking the dog or cooking dinner right. because that is when, oh, I, I don't, it's going to sound like I'm ranting here, but I, I have a tendency to fill silence with podcasts or news or music. And I think that I have to be intentional about not listening to things sometimes so I can just be right. and think. And that is when some of my writing actually gets done. Not when I'm sitting down at a laptop with my fingers on the keys, but when I'm out walking the dog with a, a, a quiet mind to solve some of the problems that I haven't been able to solve while I'm at my desk in the morning. Exactly. I always tell um, my writing students that everybody has bad days and some days it just doesn't work. But I always tell myself to learn to love that time because that's really your subconscious, just sort of churning and rearranging itself. And the next day will be better. And it usually always is. So, so what advice would you, excuse me. <laughs> Sometimes it's worse, but you still Sometimes, have to. Sometimes, right, still have right. To you still have to do it. it. <laughs> you know, as, as a guy who just wrote a book about a fisherman, and as a fisherman myself, I can tell you that it doesn't matter how many fish you didn't catch, every cast might be the one that brings you a fish. And That's right. you can't catch, if you don't keep your hook wet, you can't catch anything. So you need to always be writing, always be submitting. That's right. That's absolutely right. What advice would you give to other writers? And what was the worst and best advice that you yourself ever got? <laughs> well, actually, the best advice I ever got uh, inspired this book. And I mentioned it in Great. the acknowledgments. In 
sort of. In 2000, no, in 1994, uh, I, while I was in college, I was invited to participate in the Catherine Irene Glasscock Intercollegiate Poetry Competition at Mount Holyoke College. Wow. And uh, this is when I thought I wanted to be a poet. And by the way, my public service to the world is that I do not follow <laughs> through on that. You're welcome. Trust me. So I went to this competition and just before I got up to, <laughs> to read, um, the poet Michael Pettit was there and I asked him, I was just a young kid, you know, college junior, I guess. I said, do you have any advice for me before I get up on stage? All these luminaries in the audience, Joseph Brodsky was there. So Michael Pettit leans in and says, yeah, don't fuck up. And all these years later, that simple advice, don't fuck up, has stuck with me. And that's kind of what inspired Lewis's code in the book here. For him, it's don't be that guy. Uh, and I think it's a similar way of thinking about it. Uh, it applies in almost every situation. It may not be instructive, but it's a good reminder and it's served me well over the years. Okay, we have another great question from our Mighty Blaze, Beauty Margaret Pennard. How weird will it be for someone to go through your writer notes after your death? And have you made provision for deleting it? Oh my God, that's such a great <laughs> question. I'll let you answer that one first. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe to circle back to the last question about advice to a writer is always use private browser mode when you're doing searches for the books you're writing because oh. to... To a non-writer, your internet searches might look akin to those of a psychopath or a serial killer uh, right. because writers are inquisitive by nature and you look up the strangest things for plot points. Uh, so if you don't delete your browser history regularly, you might be confused as uh, something other than a writer. So you always use private browsing mode. That is so funny. I think that I, about 10 years ago, I decided that I wasn't going to hide anything first because it just felt better for me and second of all it's it kind of cut people off at the past who might find humiliating things out about me so <laughs> i just write it all up I'll write it all out in essays so i think everybody sort of knows everything about me already um also margaret pointed out my avenue cube puppet in the corner that I could have doctored. Um, this was actually a puppet from my son and Jeff, my husband, and I renamed him Paul, 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 Junior, Junior, Junior. And we gave him like nerd glasses that are taped together and he smokes cigarettes and he eats candy for breakfast. So thank you for <laughs> noticing that. Just to show you that writers are crazy people. Okay, so I want to ask, what are you working on now? Or are you even able to work now that you're promoting your book? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, excellent question. My next book, Ordinary Bear, uh, comes out next April. That one's uh, in the can and ready to go. Uh, and I am currently, as we talked about, I don't like to talk about things when I'm working on, but I am, I am working on something that is a little bit of a departure for me. I thought I would try and write something funny instead of something, you know, brutally dark and depressing, which tends to be my I love life. brutally dark and depressing. <laughs> I just want to put that in. So, so t can you talk about it at all? Or do you feel like you don't want to. I cannot. You cannot. Okay. <laughs> I totally get it. I totally, absolutely get it. Um, I had mentioned to you that I would love to close out this interview. If you would read like the first page, just the first page of your book. Yeah. Uh, can I, can I skip ahead a couple pages? Oh yeah, I... you can. You absolutely can. Uh, oh wait, Margaret Finard said, it's funny and there's a bear. I agree. <laughs> The bear is in the the next book, which is not the funny one. The one after that would be the funny one. It's not cocaine bear, though, is it? <laughs> no, but that is funny. <laughs> so this is uh, early early in the book. Uh, okay. Lewis is in the uh, delivery room with his wife at the birth of his daughter, Grayling. The doctor has thin wrists, slender fingers, hands you wouldn't trust to hold your drink, but he's delivered most of the babies born in the county over the last half century and claims to have only dropped a few. Strike one, he says, affecting an umpire's booming drawl as he catches the baby with hands cupped between Janie's legs. Lewis, now a fly fishing guide and a long time gone from that day on the river with his father, brushes aside the analogy with one of his own. A keeper, he says. He smiles at his wife, who's still panting for breath, knees up on the bed in front of her. Red hair fanned over the pillow like flames. He came right to the boat. She, the doctor says, 
She? Congratulations, Mr. and Mrs. Jaw. You have a beautiful baby girl. A girl? I can show you how to tell the difference if you like. <laughs> um, that is wonderful. I love it. And that's like one of the uh, that important moments of the book because he's just been planning and planning and planning on a boy. Yeah, and a few lines later, he says, uh, I, don't, I don't know what to do with a girl. I had all these plans for a son. And the, the nurse tells him, teach her all the same things. She'll be even better at them. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to remind you, please subscribe to Mighty Blaze on YouTube for more Mighty Blaze magic and also like wonderful, wonderful, amazing author interviews that you can listen to. They're all so incredible. And please buy Chris's book at bookshop.org or your favorite indie. And uh, I want to thank everybody for being here and we'll see you all next week. Everybody leave except you, Chris. Okay. Bye everybody. Thank you.